I started working on the next Sunday school lesson on Christmas Day. And uh, as I was looking at uh, how far we had got in, in the castle of giant despair, I didn't know if I had enough material, if there's something I could communicate that would be useful to go on for another lesson, but things opened up. For one thing, as I had told you in the last lesson, I had gotten a text message, email messages from a pastor in Canada, I'll call him Pastor Kevin, uh, about his daughter that he was counseling who is about 30 years old and uh, at the time he was very desperate. She was on a suicide watch and I've come into this subject kind of through the back door. I haven't gone through the counseling um, sessions. I I am Red and uh, Larry Paulison at Welch and Paul David Tripp and so on, but he was far more extensively read. I just wanted to bring in more information to be of help to him, and I was able to bring enough information that he was able to put something together where their pastors, they have a plurality of elders, it is, as best as I can tell, a Reformed Baptist work in Canada, um, they were able to put something together to counsel his daughter, which gave me a great deal of encouragement. Um, he's a lot more read in the more modern authors. But let's start with Psalm 89, verse 46. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Remember what my span of life is, for what vanity you have created all the sons of men. What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Where are your former loving kindnesses, O Lord, which you swore to David in your faithfulness? As I was thinking over the case of Christian, and I think as I compare Christian to John Bunyan in his own autobiography, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, and providentially twice a year, ChristianAudio.com has their audio books go on sale and they happen to have grace abounding to the chief of sinners and though of course I own numerous copies of it I have read it a number of times I could listen to it while I was delivering the mail and become very very familiar with John Bunyan and I see so much in Christian uh, that is like John Bunyan unlike some of the other characters in Pilgrim's Progress and I'll give you three examples of this the one uh, from the present situation that they are in, in the castle of giant despair. Brother said, Christian, what shall we do? This life we now live in this place is miserable. For my part, I don't know whether it is better to live like this or to die by our own hand. My soul chooses strangling rather than life, and the grave seems more desirable for me than this dungeon. And then he quotes Job 7.15, And my soul thought it better to be strangled and desired death more than my bones. Shall we accept the giant's advice? So if we're talking about spiritual despair here, giant despair, this has to be talking about despair in a great degree in which you would even contemplate the possibility of suicide. Christian, again, in the valley, Christian looked so confused as I watched him, it was like he didn't even know his own voice. Just when he came to the mouth of the burning pit, one of the wicked ones snuck up behind him. It whispered softly into his ear with many suggestive and distressing blasphemies. Krishna thought these blasphemies had originated in his own mind and it troubled him deeply and so on. And then at the end of the book, at the river of death, Krishna again, therefore hopeful struggled in his attempts to keep his brother's head above water. I remember the sayings of John Wesley because many of the people that he preached to, had a strong assurance of salvation, and John Wesley said, my people die well. Well, Christian is not having so good of a time at the river of death. Sometimes Christian would seem to have sunk down for good, but after a short time he would rise to the surface again as one half dead. Hopeful attempted to comfort him, saying, brother, I see the gate and men standing nearby to welcome us. But Christian answered, it is you, it is you they are waiting for. You have been hopeful ever since I first knew you. And so have you, hopeful said. Ah, oh, brother, Christian's face looked deeply troubled. Surely if I was right 
with the king who would rise now to rescue me. But on account of my sins, he has brought me into the snare and abandoned me. So before we get into this, I want to issue a disclaimer. This Sunday school class has not been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. In other words, I'm gathering information. I don't profess to be any kind of Christian counselor, but we have access to things that just simply weren't available even 170 years ago because they were so expensive to get. And some of those I'll discuss. I just found this this morning. This is the same guy I quoted in the uh, Valley of the Shadow of Death, and he had written a book on the influence of health and disease upon uh, religious experience and this book is another one that he had written and I just started reading it so I'm not going to get into that book I just want to make it known but this book I did find which I had a print on demand copy made down at Schuler Books and it, it's so nice because anything that's at books.google.com or archive.org they're able to print it out and just a few minutes, so within a couple of days I could uh, get this book. And it's interesting to me that this book never even enjoyed a second edition. It was never reprinted. And I knew the author. I had narrated the author because he had done introductory works to the works of Richard Baxter. And I knew he was going to be a trustworthy source. And so I was able to get this book. I've already narrated the whole thing and also part of uh, something else. But he talks about the three symptoms of this kind of spiritual depression, dejection, distress, and despair. And so I just want to read just a paragraph from this so that we can uh, look at what we are defining here. Under dejection or great depression of spirits, though the disease may put on its milder form, yet the mind groans under the pressure, which is really the more burdensome because it is usually of long continuance. A person in this case is apt to be very scrupulous, afraid of committing sin by every thought, word, or look. But whatever he eats, drinks, or wears... By whatever he eats, drinks, or wears, by traveling, or by staying at home. He is perhaps as prone to superstition, to make laws for himself which God never made, or to ensnare himself with needless vows and resolutions and hurtful austerities, falsely imagining that true religion consists much in imposing tasks upon himself, either in spending so many hours in devotion or in wearing a particular dress or using a particular diet. His fancy is so exceedingly erroneous and aggravating his sinfulness that every common infirmity is with him and in heinous. He is especially quick in applying to himself the threatenings of the word of God, but as much as disposed to overlook the promises, as if they were not delivered by the same authority or were not designed to be of the same extent. If his disease grows up to distress of mind, he then places religion principally in sorrow, and perhaps in painfully denying the body its necessary refreshments. Whatever he does or reads or hears, he is still turning it into fresh manner for self-accusation and self-condemnation. He loses his fitness for meditation and prayer chiefly by his terrors concerning his eternal state. As he dare not hope, therefore he dare not pray. And he is in such dread of going to the Lord's Supper that if he partakes of it, he is apt to conclude that he is eaten and drunk in his own damnation. That's a reference, of course, to 1 Corinthians 11.29. This um, sermon from 1683 by Richard Baxter was written for a set of six books in the Puritan sermons called uh, the Pur Puritan Morning Exercises. I think it was written for it. It was never preached because these... Puritans about six o'clock in the morning would gather a group of people and they would preach these sermons and they were recorded in six volumes and this sermon is so lengthy. Um, probably took 90 minutes to two hours to even narrate the whole thing. But there was something that Baxter said in this sermon that it was almost as if he had read 
John Bunyan's autobiography, I don't think he had. It just makes me wonder if what he's communicating here was common in that day, because Baxter says, some are violently haunted with blasphemous suggestions of ideas at which they tremble and yet cannot keep them out of their mind. Either they are tempted and haunted to doubt of the scripture or Christianity or the life to come or to think some ill of God. And oftentimes they are strangely urged as by something in them to speak some blasphemous word of God or to renounce him. And they tremble at the suggestion and yet it still follows them. And some poor souls yield to it and say some bad word against God. And then as soon as it is spoken, sometimes with somewhat within them says, now your damnation is seated. You have sinned against the Holy Ghost. There is no hope. Now what's so amazing about that with John Bunyan, it was the word sell him, sell him, sell Christ. No, I'll never sell Christ. Sell him, sell him. And these words came so rapidly to his mind that Bunyan in a fit of, Despair just said, I will not sell him, let him go if he will. And at that time, he plunged down into despair that took up about 18 months of his life. I don't think I have the quote here. I was redoing the notes of, uh, this is from the, uh, memoirs of uh, Thomas Halliburton. So we'll go on to the next one, the Presbyterian Examiner. That's the, this is a Princeton Review. The Presbyterian Examiner, on the other hand, in 1858 says, there is something profoundly mysterious in that state of mind which is called melancholy. It proceeds from a variety of causes and exists in very different degrees. But in its more prominent manifestations, it exhibits remarkable uniformity. Its leading trait is the gloom it throws over whatever is most interesting to the mind. When religious persons or those inclined to religion become melancholy, a deep gloom rests upon their religious prospects. They can find no evidence of piety in themselves. They have no feelings of the right kind. Imagine themselves perfectly hardened and abandoned of God. In its advanced stages, they are harassed by blasphemous thoughts, which are, they are tempted to utter. Soon they come to believe that they have committed the unpardonable sin, and deep black despair settles upon the mind. In the progress of this terrible malady, the tendency generally, perhaps uniformly, is to commit suicide, and in multitudes of instances, this has been its sad termination. So... Around the middle of the 19th century, a lot of attention was paid to this subject. And this article in the Biblical Repertory in the Princeton Review wanted to talk about what was available then and combine two things, what we knew about human physiology and what we know about spiritual experience and freely admits that the perfect book had not yet been written. Uh, one person that would have been able to do this and did write a book to some extent was David Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a physician in London, and his book uh, that he uh, you know, r wrote on, I don't know if uh, it's in this kind of detail, but these men keep quoting the same sources, and this is a pastor in England who excuse me, a, a physician in England who went to Ireland and what's so unique about him is the combination of uh, deep Christian experience and human physiology. He was such a student of these things. So I just want to uh, explain how, how pious some of these men were. And they were helped a lot by this. This is his directions for his burial. And I just think this is so edifying. I just wanted to communicate this. He's given directions of when he dies. This is what I want. My body, attended only by my sons, is to be carried to the grave by six of the villagers very early on the fourth or fifth morning after my decease. I would have no tolling of the bells. They would toll the bell when somebody passed away if it can be avoided. 
the ringers may have an order for bread. In other words, we give them food, not money, to the amount usually given upon such occasions. If they get money, they will spend it in the alehouse, and I would have them told that in life or death I would by no means give occasion for sin. My funeral must be as inexpensive as possible. Let there be no attempt at a funeral sermon. I would pass away without notice from a world which with all its pretensions is empty. Let not my family mourn for one whose trust is in Jesus. By respectful and tender care of their mother, by mutual affection, and by irreproachable conduct, my children will best show their regard for my memory. My decease may be announced in the Irish newspapers in the following words. Died at Sherrington on the day of Dr. Chain, late physician general to the forces in Ireland. Not one word more, no panegyric. I believe there is a vault belonging to the manor, but if it be under the church, I should not wish my body to be laid in it, but in the churchyard, two or three yards from the wicket which opens from the path through the fields. I pointed out the spot too, and he leaves it blank, and chose it as a fit place for a rustic monument without marble or scripture, a column such as is represented in the accompanying sketch, about seven or eight feet high. On the column, he said, you have to put these texts. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, and so on. Matthew 9, 28, 29, and 30, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men. Oh, that we had a number of doctors with this kind of piety in our day. Instead of basing their model for human physiology, pathology, and anatomy on Darwinism. As these texts are meant to rouse the insensible passenger, they must be distinctly seen. The following inscription is to be engraven on the opposite side of the column. Reader, the name, profession, and age of him whose body lies beneath are of little importance, but it may be of great importance for you to know that by the grace of God he was brought to look to the Lord Jesus as the only Savior of sinners, and that this looking unto Jesus gave peace to his soul. Reader, pray to God that you may be instructed in the gospel and be assured that God will give his Holy Spirit, the only teacher of true wisdom, to them that ask him. If any objection be made to the spot pointed out in the interment of my body, let some other be chosen, where the inscription on the column to be erected over me may be seen to advantage. The monument is for the benefit of the living and not in the honor of the dead. I wish the inscription to be preserved and leave this to my children and my children's children. So the article in the uh, biblical repertory, and I'm going to bring you some case studies because they're always very interesting of people going through these things. We were once requested to visit a lady whose state of mind had baffled every attempt made by her judicious husband to bring her relief. She was a woman of great refinement and strength of mind, eminently pious and devoted to her interesting young family, whose education she conducted herself. She homeschooled her children. While conferring every accomplishment upon her children, she was mainly anxious for their spiritual welfare. When we saw her, she was intensely excited and had slept little for several nights. She said that she had lost all interest in the instruction of her children and had become utterly regardless of their personal appearance and her own. Her whole thoughts and feelings were engrossed about their salvation, her anxiety for which had become insupportably insupportably agonizing. When instructing or dressing or leading them out for their accustomed exercise, she was incessantly distracted with the thought, what good will all this do while they are still impenitent? Though her flushed face and flashing restless eye indicated strong physical excitement, yet her mind was so clear on every subject and all her views so rational that we attributed the whole difficulty to excessive and protracted anxiety. For an object of peculiar interest to a pious mother to the salvation of her children, we made repeated attempts to reason with her on the error and evils of her present state of mind. She admitted fully the justice of our reasoning and concurred in the truth of all our positions, but we found that it was to no avail. Her excitement continued and with it her distress and all her difficulties. It appeared like a case of pure religious excitement and was so looked upon by all her family. They did not deem her deranged, but it was evident she soon would be unless relieved. 
Finding reasoning of no avail and the excitement still increasing, we became convinced on minute examination that the whole difficulty originated not in religious views or feelings at all, but in a morbid increase of arterial action arising from some physical cause. And this is a remedy in that day, and we've tried to look this up and see if there's an equivalent in our day. One twelfth of a grain of tartar emetic. Emetic? Excuse me. Emetic. Five or six times a day gave perfect relief and restored both her views and feelings to the healthy standard. Any number of instances of every variety of the disease might be cited to the same point. So this is an example of the physical body and how it affects the spiritual condition. And this is what these men wanted to get to the bottom of. At what point do these things affect our spiritual man? The only disadvantage they have that we have so much more advantage of in our day is the science of pathology. It would have been so uh, antique in those days what they knew. But I don't believe that that means they didn't have anything to say about these things. In the Presbyterian Examiner it says, We have said that melancholy is traceable to several causes. In some instances, it originates in physical disease, diseases which afflict the nervous system and produce melancholy. Some persons have a constitutional tendency of this kind, which is easily aggravated, distress of mind from disappointed hopes, sudden bereavement, loss of property, ill treatment on the part of relatives and the like often produce melancholy. In its milder forms, it frequently results from nervous exhaustion or from slight bodily indisposition. It's amazing the amount of research that they went through to try to catalog what things cause this religious despair. And some are more hopeful and some are just more entertaining, but there was a physician that worked in... uh, insane asylum in Paris and they cataloged all those things but I don't think they're really helpful here it's just interesting 28 years ago in this same article we became acquainted with two young ladies who were cousins in an eastern city where we were temporarily laboring these young ladies were well educated and highly intelligent they had been very gay and worldly On a visit to Philadelphia, they became interested on the subject of religion and returned home joyful converts. One of them was exceedingly affectionate and amiable and of a remarkably cheerful disposition. The other was of a very ardent temperament, and her nervous system was uncommonly weak. Both were very lovely Christians, and we took occasion frequently to visit and converse with them. For several weeks, their happiness continued unabated, but soon the sky of the one of ardent temperament became suddenly overcast. Her delightful emotions disappeared and were succeeded by painful depression. She became much alarmed and concluded that all her recent happiness was a delusion and that she was not really converted. Then her conscience was dreadfully troubled because she had made a public profession of religion had approached the Lord's table and had eat and drunk unworthily. So the devil has some of the same wiles that he loves to cast into our face. 1 Corinthians 11.29, Hebrews 6.4-6, Hebrews 10.26, Esau selling his birthright for a morsel of meat, and on and on. And so, obviously, any good spiritual counselor would have to be a good theologian. And that's why we're thankful for the pastors that we have here, because we're taught well. But the more she struggled, the worse her condition appeared, until she became convinced that she had no feeling, was perfectly hardened. She was on the borders of despair, confined herself to her room, refusing to see company, and felt that she dared not pray for anyone but herself. This dreadful darkness continued so long and her mental anguish was so great and constantly increasing that we became alarmed lest he should become deranged or sink into hopeless disease. We had no doubt of the genuineness of her conversion, but no presentation of the gospel or its promises that we could make availed anything. 
I was asked recently, can you give me three or four scriptures that would help people who continually never get to the point where they have any assurance of faith? And I will deal with that more. I decided this isn't the place to deal with that. We'll deal with that when we get to little faith. He's a character later on in Pilgrim's Progress, and we'll deal with people that almost never confess that they have assurance. But my point is... Sometimes those four or five scriptures aren't going to do any good until you can alleviate the suffering that's going on that's keeping them from listening with a hearing ear, from embracing the things that we're trying to communicate to them. Is there an underlying cause? Is it a misunderstanding of spiritual truth or is it physiological? So this lady exhibited singular skill as persons under the influence of melancholy generally do in showing that the promises did not apply to her case. At length we one day called to see her to make one more effort to relieve her mind. She would scarcely consent to come into the room and when she did her countenance was a picture of despair. With as much apparent cheerfulness as possible, we took a seat by her and entered into conversation and said to her, If you should find a little boy running about these streets, weeping and asking everyone he met if he had seen his father, refusing to be comforted unless he could find him, would you denounce him as a hard-hearted wretch and tell him to go about his business? She replied with some surprise at the question, Certainly not! Would you regard his distress at his father's absence and his earnest desire to find him as affording evidence of filial affection? But yes, I would. Well, you have been these two weeks seeking for your father and have been greatly troubled that you cannot find him. You now feel that if you could find him, you would be happy, and yet you say you do not love him. The effect of this illustration was surprising. She at once saw in her deep distress the evidence of her love to God. A crushing weight was suddenly lifted from her heart. Her countenance put on a cheerful aspect. She put on her bonnet and walked with us to the prayer meeting. If these kind of illustrations are useful for you, you enjoy reading them and their remedy, um, I certainly could recommend the two books by Ichabod Spencer called A Pastor's Sketches. Now those were reprinted by Solid Ground Christian Books, Michael Gadosh, but um, I had discovered him very, very early on when I came here to Grand Rapids, but um, it's very remarkable to see the wisdom that God gives certain pastors for assisting people that are in this kind of spiritual depression, but this obviously did not have its foundation in physiological causes. In this case, a melancholy arose not from disease nor from any affliction. It was simply the result of nervous exhaustion. Her mind had been intensely interested for weeks, first under conviction of sin, and then in the possession, possession of the joy of a young convert. The physical system was exhausted, and the result was sudden depression of the animal spirits. This was mistaken for the lack of religious affection and all the efforts to produce a desired feeling simply increased the exhaustion and consequently rendered the exhaustion and the depression more painful. I see I have the quote here by Thomas Halliburton. I changed these, the order of these things around, but this is a very interesting autobiography. It's the most detailed I've ever seen. 98 pages of this autobiography, this memoirs, is the agony of mind prior to really receiving relief. So this is what he says. By the extremity of this anguish, I was for some time about the close of 1697 and the beginning of 1698 dreadfully cast down. I was weary of my life. Often did I use, use Job's words, I loathe it, I would not live always, Job 7.16. And yet I was afraid to die. I had no rest. My sore ran in the night, and it ceased not in the day. At night I wish for day, and in the day I wish for night, Deuteronomy 28, 66 and 67. I said, my couch shall comfort me, but then darkness was as a shadow of death. 
When I was in this case, I was often brought to the brink of despair. He filled me with bitterness. He made me drunk with wormwood. He broke all my teeth with gravel stones. He covered me with ashes. He removed my soul. He's quoting Lamentation 3.15. He removed my soul far from peace. I forgot prosperity, and I said my strength and my hope has perished from the Lord, remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. My soul had them still in remembrance as was, and was bowed in me. Now I was made to think it a wonder that I was not consumed, and although I dreaded destruction from the Almighty, yet I could not but justify him if he had destroyed me. Righteous is the Lord, for I have rebelled. I was made to fear that the Lord would make me a mago or misabib, a terror to myself, Jeremiah 20, verse 4. And all round about... And that he would make some dreadful discovery of my wickedness that would make me a reproach to religion and give the enemies advantage, which put me upon the psalmist's prayer, deliver me from all my transgressions, make me not the reproach of the foolish. Quoting the Princeton Review, the moral treatment best adapted to relieve the depression of melancholy requires often the closest discrimination and the most untiring kindness and assiduity on the part of friends. Admittedly, not everybody has the patience for this, because it can wear you out. John Newton was simply remarkable, the friendship that he had with William Cooper. And though Cooper and John Newton were finally at a distance from each other, instead of John Newton saying, well, now I'm finally relieved of this and I can get on, he continued correspondence with him. That's a Christian attitude of, oh, love that will not let me go. He just simply refused to give up on his friend. On the one hand, too much sympathy and especially frequent conversation upon the subject will increase the evil. And on the other hand, if you are too lively and lighthearted, the patient not only fails to catch your spirit by sympathy, but sinks into deeper and darker gloom. When the mental stress and dejection are the result of disease and not the natural workings of an awakened conscience and are to be treated accordingly, there is very often a striking relative disproportion between the alleged moral cause and the degree of remorse. So he, he's quoting what he's learned by some of these authors who went before him, 1844. As Dr. Rush somewhere justly observes, imaginary guilt, imaginary guilt is a far more frequent cause than real guilt. The healthy conscience is alive equally to guilt of all kinds in proportion to its aggravation, while well, that which is morbid, morbidly affected is distressed beyond measure with that which is either imaginary or trifling and is insensible to a thousand offenses of greater magnitude out of any assignable mental cause, whatever. Where melancholy is not the, from bodily debilitation but from spiritual causes, there is the instance of a young lady we have long and intimately known of a temperament highly nervous and sanguine. She embarked very young in all her ardor in the gay pleasures of fashionable life. A single season convinced her fully of their emptiness and folly. She was soon after brought under the influence of pungent preaching and convinced of sin. The struggle was sharp and long, but the result was that she gave herself with all her heart to a course of rigid religious duties. Above all, she seemed to live in an atmosphere of prayer. Her faith in the truth and promises of God was without the shadow of a cloud, and yet she had not the pure enjoyment which she supposed to be the necessary fruit of real piety. She did not therefore look upon herself as a child of God, and her consequent anxiety wore upon her spirit and secretly undermined her health. At length, one day as she rose from prayer, the thought struck her like a thunderbolt. What if there is no God after all? She repelled the thought with horror and went her way, but the shock had struck from her hand. Remember when we were talking about uh, Christian as he was entering into the wicked gate that the arrows of the evil one were shot at him right when he was about to enter in because he sees that this is his last opportunity 
And he wants to drive you away from that faith that is needed to combat him. The shield of faith and all her efforts were unable to grasp it again. From henceforth, she found herself exposed to a constant shower of darts fiery and poison and she could not resist them they stuck fast in her vitals and drank up her spirits the poison thus injected into the heart of her religious experience soon spread and blighted the whole she never knew a moment's peace when her thoughts were upon her once favorite and still engrossing subject she called herself an infidel and applied to herself the dreadful threatenings and doom of the unbeliever and yet it was evident she was not in any sense an unbeliever she was one of the most devout and consistent persons we ever knew. She was conscientious even to scrupulosity. She was a most devoted and faithful Sunday school teacher, and God blessed her labors to the conversion of nearly all her scholars. She rejoiced to hear of persons becoming Christians and would often say with despair in her tones how she envied them. When any of her acquaintances died without giving good evidence of piety, she became excited, and as she expressed it, was ready to scream aloud for joy. She gave every possible evidence that she had not in reality a shadow of doubt about the truth of revelation, and yet no one ever dreamed that her difficulties were connected with disease of any sort, for her mind was remarkably clear and active. The advice of pious friends and pastors, therefore based upon the supposition that her case was one of spiritual darkness or satanic temptation, was to per persevere in prayer, to struggle on more earnestly, and God would give her light after he had tried her faith and patience and love. But the more she prayed and struggled, the worse she grew. She would come from her closet exhausted with a fearful conflict and looking ready to sink into utter despair. The Sabbath was always the worst day of the week, and the labor and exhaustion of teaching aggravated her symptoms. The only treatment which was successful in this case would by many have been rejected with horror. She was advised to give up the struggle which she had maintained so unequally, and which would only have resulted in disastrous consequences, to think as little as possible on the subject, to spend less time in devotional exercises and allow her mind to gather its scattered strength by relaxation. Now that may seem shocking to you, but one of the cures that is mentioned in this book is instead of having a long, extensive, introspective devotional, have a few shorter ones throughout the day. Because in that state, the mind is continually going to the dark side of things. The former prayer advice was short and audible, and such as took for granted what she had been struggling to convince herself of. Incessant pains were taken to present the character of God in a simple affectionate parental light when anything led to the subject. The simplicity of faith and the certainty of salvation were occasionally flashed across her mind when it was in a suitable frame. The only two evidences of piety which her state of mind rendered available were kept prominent as the basis of new feelings and hope, namely her love to the people of God and the pain she felt in the absence of divine favor. These were untouched by the dismal monster that had preyed upon her hopes. By a judicious perseverance in a course like this, accompanied with well-directed hygienic measures, suitable recreation, exercise, and diet for improving the general health, and especially the tone of the nervous system, the mental energies were often in such cases available and new views of truth and new hopes will then spring up in the mind. That's a quote from the Princeton Review. So let me cover quickly the cure. They who are under the power of melancholy, says Archbishop Tillotson, are seldom fit to take that counsel which alone is fit to be given them, and that is not to believe themselves concerning themselves. But at this point they have to trust the judgment of others rather than their own apprehensions. In other cases, every man knows himself best, but a melancholy man is most in the dark as to himself, end quote. First, we should be affectionately concerned for the distressed state of those pious persons who are afflicted with religious melancholy. Secondly, 
Persons in these afflicted circumstances and under such mistaken apprehensions concerning some religious tenets must be urged to trust in the mercies of God through Christ, but their darkness of mind is their grand objection against the duty of trusting in God. Let not even your devotional exercises be too intense or too long a continuance. Meditating on divine subjects, closet prayer, or any other religious employment, especially in secret, should be short in some measure, resembling ejaculatory prayer. If the stomach be sickly, physicians will wish to promote digestion by eating little and often, not by going to the all-you-can-eat buffet, as Michael. Do not so much abound in the confessing and aggravating the sins you have committed as to forget or omit being thankful for the innumerable mercies you have been receiving. Do not cherish but pray and strive against desponding thoughts. They rob God of his glory. They give Satan an advantage over you. They unfit you for loving God. They lead you to hate him and fly from him and a slight Christ and undervaluing the blessings of his gospel. Take heed of concluding yourselves the objects of God's everlasting displeasure only because he is at present hiding himself. Just because you're experiencing spiritual desertion, and I'm not even getting into that subject, that's a whole other subject, of the manifest presence of God and God hiding himself. But do not mistake your feeling that God is hiding himself from you is his displeasure of you. He's trying your faith. All the greatest terrors and agonies of melancholy persons are but comparatively for a moment. Avoid solitariness. See what happens often. And I know this from my own experience. The people that are going through this like to be alone. A lot of times they don't want people to talk to them. A lot of times they don't want to hear any more counsel, and they always have an objection to whatever counsel you, you give them. But avoid it. It says, keep always in good company, sing the Psalms and converse upon the Holy Scriptures. Secondly, though it be the most difficult point to work upon the mind, yet it is the most present remedy. If they can through grace persuade themselves that those grievous thoughts are not their own but Satan's, and that therefore they should earnestly endeavor to turn the heart to other objects and quit these evil suggestions, for to dwell upon them or fight with them or to aim to overcome them or to wait for an end of them is only to irritate and strengthen them. Um, in the last two weeks as I was listening to um, John Piper's autobiography, I mean, excuse me, biography of uh, William Cooper, Piper says that he was concerned that it just appeared that William Cooper was not physically active enough. And he compared him to a pastor who lived at the same time, William Carey. And Carey, whether you know it or not, lived with a wife who was really spiritually distressed. But he stayed so busy. He had a vision before him. And Piper's concern about Cooper is that he just wasn't active. Physical activity is a help in this regard to keep your thoughts from consuming you and I know I went through it when I was it was 1983 down in Louisiana and uh, I had a very physically demanding job and uh, you know I didn't I didn't like it it was hot it was humid and it would wear me out and yet God was using this to get me out of this introspective self-condemning frame we should then not fail to inform these persons recovered from a state as bad as their own. In other words, let them know of others who have been in this condition and have been relieved from it, that their circumstances, their condition has been alleviated. It may please God to render one or other of them more especially suitable and effectual. Ed Welch in Depression, looking up from the stubborn darkness. Now here's a question that I was asked, and I'm going to, let him answer it, and that is, what place can medication have in this regard? And I am quoting him because I want to be very, very careful. This isn't coming from me. I rely upon somebody who's a lot more conversed in this stuff. The problem with immediately opting for a medical explanation is that once the decision is made, every other perspective seems superficial or irrelevant. Why, for example, would you bother considering other contributors when a pill might provide relief? 
Now, Ed Welch is balanced because we've come a long way from the early 1970s when Jay Adams wrote Competent to Counsel, and that is Adams did not leave enough room for the possibility of the physiology. And, I mean, if you even mention any kind of medicine that might help, um, I don't think Jay Adams would have heard anything about it, but I was listening to an interview with Larry Paulison, and he said, for the 1970s, though, if you have an empty barrel and you toss a coin into it, it's going to make some noise. We needed something because counseling was so bankrupt in the 70s and 80s. So a Adams had a start, but I think we're a lot more balanced in our day. If depressed persons assume that their problem is fundamentally medical, asking them to look at their relationships or their basic beliefs about God will seem as useful as prescribing physical exercise for baldness. Exercise is always helpful, but it won't grow here. When reason, the previous chapter urges you to describe your feelings, talk to people about it. As you do, you will begin to notice the fears, failures, losses, frustrations, and broken relationships that might be attached to your feelings. So some people race to certain explanations and they hope that once they discover that sin that's causing this, everything will change. Others run from this perspective. They think spiritual explanations are prehistoric and misguided. The truth is in the middle of these two poles. Sin can certainly be a cause of depression, but you must be careful about connecting the dots between the two. If you're being honest, you will always find sin in your life. Everyone does. That doesn't mean that sin caused a spiritual depression. So I want to move on to the end of the castle of giant despair because I don't want to communicate too much on this stuff. Um, just enough for you to do the research for yourself if you find it useful, but one thing I can tell you is that the pastor who benefited from some of the sources that I gave him created a three-page letter of how they were going to counsel his daughter, and I said some of this could be very useful. So if you know someone or are someone that needs that kind of counsel, I think it's a good balance of what's in this book that I quoted and also, he's very well read in Ed Welch and others. And I specifically say Ed Welch because that's his specialty. I found it interesting when they were, uh, it was Mark Deborah was uh, interviewing Larry Paulison about his colleague Ed Welch. He said that if uh, somebody comes into our clinic and they are eight different people and have some really psychosomatic disorders, those are people Ed Welch gravitates to. He loves to study people. And so that's where his strengths are. And his book is called This Present Darkness. But anyway, on Saturday about midnight, Christian and Hopeful began to pray. I'm going to say this again so you don't miss this. On Saturday about midnight. Why is that significant? They were about to start the Lord's Day. A little before dawn, good Christian, as one half amazed, broke out into this passionate exclamation. What a fool I have been to lie in a stinking dungeon like this, when I could just as well walk free. I have a key in my pocket next to my heart called promise that I am sure will open any lock in Doubting Castle. This is good news, good brother. Pluck it from your pocket and try it. So Christian pulled a key from his chest pocket and fitted into the lock on the dungeon door. As he turned the key, the bolt released, and the door flew open with ease. Christian and Hopeful both fled the dark cell. Then he went to the outward door that led into the castle yard. He tried his key, and it opened that door also. From there he made haste to the outer iron gate, for he knew he must open that gate to escape. But he struggled with that lock, for it was desperately hard. But finally the key opened it. They thrust the gate open to make their escape, but as it opened, the gate made such a creaking noise that it woke giant despair. He hastily left his bed and pursued his prisoners, but he felt paralysis overcoming his limbs, for one of his fits came over him again and made it impossible for him to go after them. 
So Christian and Hopeful hurried on until they came to the king's highway. Once again they were safe because they were out of the giant's jurisdiction. Now when they had crossed over the stile, they began to consider what they could do at that location to prevent pilgrims coming after them from being deceived and falling into the hands of giant despair. They agreed between themselves to erect a pillar with a clear message engraved on its side saying, Over the stile is a way to Doubting Castle, which is kept by giant despair who despises the king of the celestial country and seeks to destroy his holy pilgrims. As a result, many who have followed after them have read what was written and escaped the danger. This is Saturday, the end of a weary week, four days of which had been already spent in the dark dungeon. A new spirit now possesses the imprisoned pilgrims. They began to pray. Their prayer was like the wrestling of Jacob. It continued all night, even to the break of day. And that new day was the Sabbath. John Bunyan evidently desires to leave on record in his immortal allegory some testimony in honor of the Lord's Day and of its blessed privileges. So upon this day of rest, this day of peculiar prayer, he represents the dawn of deliverance beaming upon the prisoners of despair. He now became prisoners of hope. Who now became prisoners of hope? And is it not true that the Sabbath day, by its holy rest and hallowed ministrations of the word and prayer, breaks many a fetter, frees many a slave, dissolves the doubts of the weak past, and delivers many a soul from the bondage of despair? A key called promise. In prayer comes a realization of the promises. Every prayer is founded on a promise, and every true prayer discovers this foundation. The promises of God, all of which are yea and amen in Christ Jesus, penetrate every gloom and look beyond the thickest darkness. The promises fringe the thundercloud with rays of light and enable us to discern the smiling face behind the frowning providence. So, obviously, he's quoting William Cooper there. I believe this is uh, George Cheever. Promise sees the dawn for the midnight, anticipates the sunrise from the sunset, recognizes in the leafless trees, leafless trees and cheerless snows of winter the harbinger and earnest of the fruits and flowers and seasonable enjoyments of the summer tide. The key of promise now opens the doors and iron gates of the dungeon of Doubting Castle and delivers the pilgrims out of the hands of giant despair. So they escaped and once more returned to the narrow way. And now they use, as all pilgrims should do, their own bitter experience for good to others. They mean to keep others, if possible, from falling into the same snare with themselves. And so as soon as they are got safe into the Lord's blessed highway and out of their enemy's jurisdiction, they proceed to nail up that famous inscription, Over this style lies a way to Doubting Castle, kept by giant despair. They thought forsooth that no pilgrim after them reading this inscription would dare go out of the way. But by a strange blindness which happens to the pilgrims, whenever they are bent on self-indulgence, they are so taken with the metal that they do not read the inscription. And so they pass over the same style, just as if no persons had ever tried it before, and just as if there were no giant despair's castle. Before Christian and Hopeful passed by, there had been been just such inscriptions, but the pilgrims did not heed them. King David himself, who spent so long time in the castle, put up just such an inscription near 3,000 years ago, and Solomon from bitter experience renewed it after him, but Christian and Hopeful themselves did not read it. Nor do any read it except the Lord enlighten their darkness and make them vigilant at the very moment temptation comes upon them. For the time when they enter into temptation is the time when this inscription disappears and when they are once entered in as in a cloud. They can hear nothing, see nothing but the temptation itself. And so they fall and are afterwards made wretched. May the Lord keep us from such dreadful experience. Oh, what dread meaning there is in those words of Christ. Pray that you enter not into temptation. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Entering into temptation is a very different thing from being assailed by temptation. But in neither case can we conquer or be delivered except by Christ. George Cheever, Lectures on Pilgrim's Progress, which is interesting because that came out in uh, 1846, the same year that Joseph Jones' book came out. 
And uh, with that, I'll ask Pastor David if you have any closing comments, and especially because you've been more trained in these things. Oh, yeah. Um, as a letter carrier, I uh, deal a lot with uh, customers around springtime. And, you know, a lot of our folk go down to Florida, and uh, I know they enjoy it. But I would say that in springtime, as you look at some of the people that come out to walk their dog or even start to mow their lawns and so on, after a long winter, I think the jubilation here is not even surpassed by people that are in Florida because they could take that for granted. Here we love spring because it's like a new day for us. And so I think you are so correct in what you're saying, but with that I better close. Father, again I say to you, more light We all do need more light and counsel on people that are in this kind of spiritual depression. We thank you for the light that has been brought to us, but only you can enlighten the eyes of the understanding to embrace these promises when somebody is, in fact, going through these deep waters. May we be as patient as John Newton was to William Cooper when he was going through these things and Oh, how far we fall short. Forgive us, bless us, and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.